The Road and the Miles to Dundee by Val McDermott The captain has turned off the seatbelt sign, but we recommend for your safety that you keep your seatbelt fastened. I'm 30,000 feet above somewhere. I don't much care where. I'm flying to a festival to read from a work in a country I can't point to on a map. I'm flying away from the ending of the relationship I never expected to die. My life feels ragged and wrecked, my heart torn and trampled. It's as if the last dozen years have been folded up tight like tissue paper turning into a hard lump that could stick in my throat and choke me. I take out the book of Ali Smith's short stories I've brought in an attempt to distract me. I can't actually concentrate for long enough to manage a novel. Bite-sized chunks is about my speed right now. A few stories in, I start reading one called Scottish love songs. It's magical and strange, tragic and funny, but most of all, it's an affirmation of the power and endurance of love. I'm bearing up well, until the imaginary bagpipers in the story start playing the road and the miles to Dundee. Are you okay? Well, obviously you're not okay, but can I help? I've got some tissues in my bag. No, it's fine. I'm sorry. Just ignore me. Here. Thanks. Thanks. Sorry. The story I was reading... Mm-hmm. It mentions the road and the miles to Dundee. A song. It always sets me off. <laughs> oh, my goodness. You're Stella Granger, aren't you? Uh-huh. <laughs> We're both going to the short story festival in Belgrade. You won't have heard of me. <laughs> I've just published my first collection. Jan Mackey, that's me. <laughs> Under the Greenwood Sea? I read it of you. I'm so excited to meet you. I've loved your work for years. You show what short stories can do. You mean, like, reduce someone to tears on a plane? (laughs) That's a bit extreme, but yeah, I suppose so. Why this story, though? Picture me, 11 years old, in a lemon yellow party dress with blue roses. It makes my skin look like semolina pudding. And it's too tight because it's a hand-me-down from a beanpole cousin. (laughs) I know all about that. I've got two older sisters. (laughs) We're all crammed into my Auntie Jean's living room. And the adults are all red in the face and cheery with the drink. It's my big cousin Senga's 21st. Which is why I'm wearing the party frock. I'm that fed up. I've made myself a den. And who could blame you? I'm sitting under the table with a tumbler of lemonade and a bowl of crisps I sneaked away when nobody was looking. It's time for the party pieces. Auntie Jean's got her rum and coke and she's away. Eyes shut, swaying a wee bit with the emotion. She always used to sing Granny's Healing Haim. But lately, she's taken to that Julie Rogers song. The wedding. Maybe she's trying to tell her Senga something. I see the church. I see the people. Her voice is rusty with fags, but she belts it out all the same. And I can hear sweet voices singing. Dad says when God was handing out voices, Auntie Jean was in the lobby. (laughs) 
Then it's my dad's turn. He plants his feet a wee bit apart and squares his shoulders in his good grey suit. I know what's coming. Nobody else would dare sing this. Cold winter was howling o'er moor and o'er mountain and wild was the surge on the dark rolling sea. When just about daybreak I met a young lassie who asked me the road and the miles to Dundee. Without thinking about it, I've eased out from under the table to hear better. And that's when that evil witch Auntie Betty spots me. Says I to the lassie, I canna will tell ye. My God, have you ate that whole bowl of crisps yourself? Nay wonder you've got all that puppy fat on you. I want to die. Instead of looking at my dad, everybody's looking at me. I can see them thinking, greedy wee shite, as clearly as if they had cartoon thought bubbles over their heads. I want to shout out that I just look fat because it's not my dress. Leave the bairn alone, Betty. Jim, I'm only speaking out for her own good. Betty, you've always been an interfering bitch. Now leave my bairn alone. He crouched down beside me and put his hand over mine. My hero. Wow. We'll probably be in the same terrible hotel. Can I buy you a drink when we get there? To say thanks. Thanks for what? The tissue. Nobody wants to arrive in a strange city with snotters on their sleeve, after all. Here you go. A whole bottle? <laughs> wow. The only one they do by the glass nodlet paint stripper. This one at least should be drinkable. To serendipitous encounters. Mm, I'm all for that. Tell me if it's none of my business, but do books often get you like that? You're bold. Sorry, I didn't mean to pry. <laughs> no, it's me who should apologize. I'm not in the best place right now. I'm just coming out of a bad breakup, and somehow the road and the miles to Dundee has always managed to be my soundtrack to the worst of times. Hey, hey, hey. Dear God. We could always take the bottle upstairs. My room's quite nice. It's got a view of the equestrian statue. <laughs> Better than mine. I'm looking down the ventilation shaft. <laughs> But can ye permit me to gang a wee bitty? I'd show you the road and the miles to Dundee. The Great Escape. You're right. You do have a better view than me. That seems wrong. You're the big star and I'm the new kid on the block. Maybe you're big in Belgrade. <laughs> <laughs> Does this window open? You've got a tiny balcony out there. Let me see. No way am I risking your life on that. Maybe just settle for the view. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are you working on at the moment? I'm not. Like I said, bad breakup. I can't think. Never mind write. That's tough. Do you want to talk about it? <laughs> Talking isn't going to make a difference. Then maybe action would. She appeared like an angel in feature and form as she walked by my side on the road to Dundee. Oh. Oh. That was just... <laughs> it was, wasn't it? Not what I was expecting. <laughs> I don't do... Shh, you do now. Apparently. Oh, God. We should be at the opening ceremony. The mayor welcoming us to his beautiful city. With its history of culture. And ten centuries of war and conquest. Followed by five readings of the longest short stories in the world. In languages neither of us speaks. <laughs> <laughs> or... We could stay here and make a story of our own. I'll need to get my second wind first. I'm not as young as you. Mm. 
Tell me more about the road to Dundee. Are you addicted to my tales of woe or what? <laughs> I'm at risk of being addicted to you, Stella. Don't make that mistake, Jen. Am I going to have to tickle it out of you? Uh, <laughs> no. no. <laughs> stop it. Stop it. I'm really tickling. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay, I give in. Fast forward half a dozen years. I'm standing on the edge of my future. I'm on the brink of heading off to university. Imagine that. A working class lassie for Fife, about to reach escape velocity and land on planet Oxford. Were you scared? A bit, yeah. But mostly I was excited. Growing up, I never felt like I fitted in. I wasn't interested in boys. I didn't want to settle down and have a family. I wanted to have adventures. And going off to Oxford, where nobody knew me, I could make myself up from scratch. I'd say you've done a pretty good job of that. The night I'm talking about, that felt like having a wrestling match with my history. We had this thing in Scotland called a spree where a prospective bride and groom have a party with friends and family and the wedding presents. So there we all were, in the Miners' Welfare Institute Hall for Ursenga's spree. Is she in all your stories, your cousin Senga? That's some show of presents. Oh. I get the crockery, the towels, the glasses, but the other stuff. A china ornament of a shepherdess. Senga, bring that brave fella you're marrying over here. So we can all get a right good look at him. Oh, poor son. He's no idea what he's marrying into. Yeah, should you not be over there with the ladies, huh? Instead of standing here at the bar with us men. I prefer a pint to a sweet sherry. Uh, square peg, Andy. That's your Stella. Oh, right enough. By the way, have you checked out the casserole dishes? The casserole dishes? What about them? There's 23 of them. <laughs> Aye, aye, the, the co-op had a special offer on them last month. Oh, jeez, I hope they'll do a swap. <laughs> Otherwise, we'll all be getting casserole dishes for our Christmas. <laughs> Oi, is it no about time the singing got started? Is your Aunt Betty any better a singer than your Aunt Jean? Nobody could be quite that bad. <laughs> My dad always got things going at family parties. So he stirred himself and strolled up to the wee stage where the trio of accordion, drums, guitar were gamely pretending anybody's listening. Ladies and gentlemen, now we've all had time to get a bit of Dutch courage. The band has kindly agreed that they'll accompany anybody who wants to give us a song. Just to show you there's nothing to be feared of, I'll start off the proceedings. be sweet to convoy a young lassie, though it's only to show her the road to Dundee. Who's next? Meet we, boys. Do you know the wedding? No, they don't. Give us Granny's heel and hand, Jean. The heather bells are blooming just outside Granny's door. Where as laddies there we played in days of long ago, neath the shadow of Enbrand. Always good to get Auntie Jean out the way early on the proceedings, eh? You know, it can of get worse. <laughs> <laughs> right enough. <laughs> Does it not strike you as a wee bit hypocritical? You singing that song? How? It's all about a man who takes pity on a lassie who's trying to get to Dundee, right? He helps her with no thought of anything in return, right? Uh -huh. Oh, watch yourself, Uncle. You're crossing swords with the Queen of the Debating Society. He does the right thing, the fellow in the song. So? How come you won't pick up hitchhikers then, eh? Oh, she has got you there, fair and square. <laughs> Game, set and match, I'd say. 
But that's not a sad story, Stella. It's funny and clever. To me, it's sad twice over. I was saying goodbye to the life I'd had till then because I couldn't find a way to make sense of myself within it. The other sad bit is that I spent most of my teenage years at odds with my dad. Hang on. I've got something that can help with that. Ta-da! Oh, my duty free. <laughs> Let's see. Speyside. You chose a morning whiskey. I get a free pass, right? <laughs> I'm a foreigner. Actually, my dad liked a Speyside malt. So, let's drink to him. It grieves me that I wasted so much of the time I had with him back then. We were kindred spirits, and we should have been making the most of that instead of fighting. Was it because you were gay? No. I didn't know I was gay till a wee while later. But once I did, that was the one thing we never thought about. Miraculously... Even though they were working class to the core, both of my parents took it in their stride. I've been bringing women home with me since I was 21. Amazing. If I drink any more on an empty stomach, we'll both regret it. Let's find somewhere to eat. She said, gentle sir, I can never forget ye for showing me so far on the road to Dundee. So... You said you tell me the rest of the story later. By my watch, it's later. Fast forward again then. This time, to three years ago, I was in the States visiting my old college pal, Antonia. They've got a house on the shores of Lake Champlain. So beautiful there. Mm, you know it? Yeah, what a great place to live. Oh, it's a beautiful late summer afternoon. We'd been sailing on the lake, then we dived in for a swim. The air was warm, but the water was dark and chill. Oh. Wait! Race you to the shore! Not fair! You do this every day! You're getting soft in your old age, Stella. Come on! Race you to the house! Why are you always so bloody competitive? Hot chocolate, Stella. Hot chocolate and a hot shower. And after the hot chocolate and the hot shower, Dirty martinis while Antonia barbecued steaks on the deck. We were having the best of times. I had not a single premonition of disaster. <laughs> if I'd known what was coming for me, I wouldn't have slept through those last hours when my life still tasted so good. Stella, wake up the what? The foam. It's for you. Mm, for me? You need to wake up, Stella. Oh. It's important. Oh. Give me. <clears throat> uh, hello? Stella, doll, is uh, that you? Uh, it's Jean. Aye. Uh, it's the middle of the night here. We've only just tracked you down. Oh, it's your dad, Stella. My, my dad? What about my dad? He was playing bowls. He walked out on the green to play the final of the tournament. He took a massive heart attack and dropped down dead. Dead? He's never ill. The ambulance was there in less than five minutes, but it was too late. No. No. Oh, you need to come home, Stella. Your mum needs you. Oh, Stella. Three years ago, but it's as sharp as last night. Let's walk. I can't imagine what that must have been like, said the writer. Ouch. Point taken. So tell me how it was. Antonia sorted out my flights, but I had six hours to kill in New York. It was pouring with rain. I had to do something to pass the time, so I bought the first packet of cigarettes I've had for years. I walked around Central Park, chain smoking in the rain. Smoke and rain, good excuses for a wet face and red eyes. I'm glad you didn't take up smoking again. I hate the smell. 
Come here. Mm. Mm. I got soaked to the skin. My passport was in my pocket. It got wet through as well. Look. Still crinkled. Every time I travel abroad, every time I have to show ID, I lose my dad all over again. I walked for miles that day, and every step I took, all I could hear was his voice. Then bravely I kissed the sweet lips of oh, that lassie, ere I parted with her on the road to Dundee. I guess there are worse things to be haunted by. I barely got back in time for the funeral. I don't know whether it was shock or grief or jet lag, but the funeral's just a blur of faces and other people's tears. The crematorium was packed. It felt like forever before we got back to the house. It took Auntie Betty... Betty the bitch, right? (laughs) Right. It took her to knock me back into reality. I was in the kitchen with our singer, making potted meat sandwiches for the entire extended family. Because that's what you do in our family after a funeral. Everybody eats like it might be their last meal. So, there I was, with a bread knife, when Betty breinged in. Oh, there you are, Stella. Are you awfully upset about your dad, then? (laughs) What did you just say? I'll just take the bread knife, Stella. If you don't mind, Auntie Betty, there's no really room for three folk in here and we need to get the sandwiches done. Right enough. I just thought I'd come and tell you Simon's going to give us a wee song. He's going to give us the road and the miles to Dundee. Are you serious? I'm off. Wait still. Come back. Don't let her get to you. Get out. My road singer. She's not worth that. That's my dad's song and she knows it. I wish it was her burnt to ash instead of my dad. I can't do this. Stella, you can't drive. You've had too much to drink. Watch me. It's a miracle I didn't kill myself. Or anyone else. But I get how you couldn't be under the same roof as that woman for another minute. Where did you go? There's a big hill in the middle of Fife. Falkland Hill. The first time I climbed it was with my dad. The night before my sixth birthday. It felt like a mountain to my wee five-year-old legs. We stood on the top, looking down at Fife, spread beneath our feet like a magic carpet. So I drove to the car park near the summit. One of my dad's friends had given me a CD as he left the crematorium. A wee compilation for you, he said. I slotted it into the CD player turned the volume up full and stood on the hillside as my dad's voice filled the sky. So now you know why I was sobbing like an idiot on the plane. When you said a bad breakup. Oh, at the moment, I did mean the girlfriend. That's why I was feeling so raw. But the song, even on the page, that reminded me what real grief is. But it's a love song, Stella. You need to remember that. It's all about someone you still love. Maybe you could replace the sad connections with good ones. Easier said than done. Start here. Sweet. See? It's not so hard. Aye, but this isn't the real world. This is Belgrade, and I'm flying home tomorrow after my reading and my panel. I'll be flying back two days later. We can meet again in the real world. I'm not ready for this, Jen. You deserve better than to be my rebound fling. It doesn't have to be that. And it won't be. Not if we kiss goodbye before the sun comes up like all the best folk tales and fairy stories. I thought you... I did. I thought we... And it was... And let's keep it like that. I've only been away 36 hours, but something in me's 
shifted. I thought I was just having a wee adventure to take my mind off all the crap waiting for me back home. But no, I don't know how she did it. But Jen opened my eyes. I need to strip away every association from this damn song except the sweetness of my father's voice. Just like a fairy story, some alchemy happened in that hotel room in Belgrade. And like an idiot, I drew a line under it. I don't even have her contact details. She typed them into my phone and as soon as I left her room, I wiped them. I can picture my dad rolling his eyes at me and shaking his head like he's exasperated at my stupidity. <laughs> and not for the first time. I'm coming! Stella Granger. Aye, but... These are for you. Yellow roses? Are you sure? A dozen. Somebody really likes you. There's a card. I hope I got the spelling right. So here's to the lassie. So here's I ne'er can forget to the lassie. I ne'er can forget her. And ilk a young laddie that's listening to me. Oh, never be swear to convoy a young lassie. Though it's only to show her the road to Dundee. <laughs> Your beauty! Hello, I just landed in Edinburgh. Can you tell me the road and the miles to you? Wow. You get the tram from the airport and stay on it all the way into town. The Road and the Miles to Dundee was written by Val McDermott. Stella was played by Louise Oliver. Jen was Susanna Lane. Aunties Jean and Betty were Barbara Dixon. Stella's dad was John Kazek. Andy was Michael Monroe. And the tenor was Cameron Goodall. The Road and the Miles to Dundee was produced and directed by Taran Alley and was a Bona Broadcasting production for the BBC.